Order it being 2 p.m., I will call, move to questions and call Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. In the minister's letter to Senator Hanson committing to bringing forward the delivery of the Dairy Code of Conduct, the minister said, and I quote, I'm planning for that to happen by December 2019. Yesterday, the minister mentioned in passing, in answer to a question, that the code, and I quote, is on track to be in place by 1 January 2020. When was the decision made to delay implementation of the code from December to January? Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, Senator McCarthy, and thank you on behalf of all the dairy farmers in your uh, in the Northern Territory for your interest, your sudden interest in the dairy industry. We on this side of uh, the Senate have long stood with our dairy farmers and our dairy industry to seek to assure that they have a sustainable and profitable future, that future generations of Australians can enjoy safe, nutritious dairy products produced right here in Australia. And it is why at the last election we committed to introduce a mandatory code of conduct on the back of the egregious behaviour of the milk processors against our dairy farmers uh, following the step-downs and the clawbacks by Murray Goldman and Fonterra uh, back in 2015. In 2016, the ACCC inquiry we uh, conducted actually recommended the mandatory code, and we're fulfilling that. Along with our commitment around the mandatory code, we also have $22 million worth of initiatives, everything from improving financial uh, and legal literacy of our dairy farmers, uh, their energy efficiency, providing for support order. around Order. Senator McKenzie. Fodder. I've got Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Point of order, direct relevance. There was one question, which is when did she decide to delay the implementation of the code? Um, on, the, on, on the point of order, you've reminded the minister of the question. Um, Senator McKenzie's response can directly address issues around the timing of the code of conduct. I, I ask the minister to take note of that and call the minister to continue. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr. President. That $22 million of additional support actually addresses the reason why our dairy farmers are doing it so tough. The increased fodder prices, increased electricity prices uh, and increased water prices, which are putting incredible pressure on the input costs for our dairy farmers, despite them getting an historically high uh, farm gate price from the processors. In terms of bringing the dairy code forward from our election commitment uh, to deliver that by June 2020, we have always been public in our statements that we will deliver the code as quickly as possible, because we know right now uh, milk processors are attempting to sign our dairy farmers up to contracts of in excess of five years. So the sooner we can bring that in, the better. But I've also said we Order, won't be Senator introducing McKenzie, a code. Time for the answers expired. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Yesterday, the minister refused to explain why her own backbenchers were bypassing her and advocating for dairy farmers direct to the CEOs of major supermarkets, Coles and Woolworths. I asked the minister, did Senator Macdonald seek her advice? prior to writing to the CEOs of Coles and Woolworths, or was she simply bypassed because her Nationals colleagues have no confidence in her? Senator McKenzie. Well, Senator McCarthy, the National Party, both Senator Macdonald, myself, uh, Barnaby Joyce, Wacker Williams, Barry O'Sullivan, Matt Canavan. I could go through a raft of National Party MPs and senators over the eight years I've been here, and none of us have taken a backward step when it comes to holding the duopoly in this country of Coles and Woolworths to account not just for our dairy farmers but for our horticultural farmers, for the beef industry and the like. They've been ripping off our farmers over time order. because of their excessive Senator, market Senator Watt, power. Senator Watt, on a point of order. On relevance, the question was seeking an answer as to whether the minister was consulted about the letter. Um, uh, I might also say that the, the, the question contained other elements which I might refer to more broadly as commentary, and I think the minister is entitled to be directly relevant and respond to that as well. Senator McKenzie. Um, my point being is, as a political party, we talk about how we hold the supermarkets to account with the, what they're actually paying our producers all the time. So Senator Macdonald and I have been in conversations about that. 
Senator Canavan and I have been in conversations about that. A raft Order. of National Party MPs and senators are actively engaged Order. in working out how we can better Order. evolve Order. Senator competition McKenzie, laws time for the country. answers expired. Please, Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Nationals member for Lynn, Dr Gillespie, has warned the minister's draft code dudded farmers and refused to rule out a leadership tilt over the issue. Is the minister confident her dairy code of conduct will satisfy Dr Gillespie? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you again for your question, and I will repeat what I've said in this place and publicly often. This is not my code of conduct. It is not our government's code of conduct. It will be the dairy industry's code of conduct. There are eight unique regions of dairying in this country, each with very unique challenges and opportunities, and the mandatory code of conduct to govern their relationship between the processes has to be fit for all. And so it is not up to David Gillespie or Bridget McKenzie or Susie Macdonald or Perrin Davey to devise a code of conduct that we think suits us. It is for us as a government to deliver a mandatory code of conduct that delivers for the dairy farmers in this country and actually assures them of a transparent model for dealing with uh, their processes. David Gillespie has been a strong advocate for a broader tra trading platform, a transparent trading platform around and quite an innovative model of trading milk, which the dairy industry itself is examining. Now, as I've said, we've put the draft code out for Order, consult. Senator McKenzie, We're now dealing time with that feedback. For the answer has expired. Before I come to you, Senator Brockman, I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber of the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly of the Parliament of Queensland, the Honourable Curtis Pitt MP. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to the Senate, indeed to question time. Uh, and with the concurrence of honourable senators, I invite the speaker to take a seat on the floor of the Senate. Welcome. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Today is the International Day of People with Disability. Can the minister outline how the Morrison government's sound budget and economic management is guaranteeing the essential services Australians with a disability and their families rely on, including measures to support acceptance and celebrate their achievements? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, uh, Senator Brockman, for this really important question. Um, we on this side understand that uh, building a more inclusive uh, and accessible society for uh, more than 4.4 million Australians. That's one in five Australians who live with a disability. And today, as International Day of People with Disability, um, Mr. President, can I call a point of order on those on the other side? That I think it's really disrespectful to people with disability well, that they're I might, interjecting. I, I, I think Senator, <laughs> Senator Wong on a point of order. Well, I, well, I'm not sure if the minister did call a point of order, but I, I, I would respond on the point of order which you appear to be entertaining. She began her statement with a partisan statement. Uh, we on this side understand. So people on our side, understandably, given how much the Labor Party has fought for the rights Order. of and services Senator Wong, for please. people with disability, Senator Wong, while pretty I know annoyed it's the by last it. week of the Senate, but Senator Wong, that, um, that, wasn't, that last bit wasn't a point of order. Senator Cormann. Uh, on the point of order, the only thing that was uh, out of order in the last few minutes was uh, the constant <laughs> interjections uh, from uh, that side. Uh, interjections are always disorderly, as Order. Senator Wong well knows, and the level of interjections that we've been experiencing Senator, Senator Pratt. is un even, even as a Senator point of Pratt. order is being raised. Order. I accept. Or I'm, can I say, on that particular occasion, I think I heard the first interjection before I heard the first word out of the minister's mouth. It is the last week of the Senate. Um, people are, tend to be somewhat more boisterous. But can I remind them that interjections are always disorderly? Uh, and it is not a sign. It is a sign of a lack of courtesy to your colleagues who cannot necessarily hear a response. I re say that to all senators in the chamber. Senator Rustin, to continue. Thank you very much. Shall we start again? Today is International Day of People with Disability, and today is a day when we have the opportunity to celebrate uh, with the people of Australia, the 4.4 million or the nearly one in five Australians who live with a disability, to celebrate their achievements and their contribution that they make to Australian society. Um, today is also a day that we should be asking ourselves what can we do, what more can we do to make sure that the lives of people who live with disability can be enhanced. 
The theme of this year's International Day of People with Disability is promoting the participation of persons with disabilities and their leadership. And I'd like to acknowledge Kurt Fernley, uh, who is the, person, is the International uh, People with Disabilities Day, uh, is their patron for this year. He is one of the most inspirational athletes you will ever meet. And today we don't just celebrate the achievements of people like Kurt or Dylan Orcott, our famous tennis player, or Ben Gauntlet, but we celebrate the achievements of every Australian who lives with disability. Um, and every Australian uh, deserves the opportunity to reach their full potential, and that must include our Australians who live with disability. This year, as part of International Day of Disability, we're trying to encourage schools to participate through the growing, uh, Grow Inclusion competition so that we can mainstream the idea that people with a disability have every right to have the same opportunities to be able to set their goals for themselves as every other Australian takes as their right. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. How is the government breaking down barriers and encouraging employers to hire more people with a disability? Senator Ruskin. Thank you very much. Um, we are absolutely committed to improving the employment opportunity for all Australians, but given my position as the Minister responsible for social services, I am particularly focused on uh, making sure that disability employment is a very, very important part of our policy platform. My one simple goal is to make sure that we give people who have disability the same access to uh, the broad suite of employment opportunities that every other Australian has access to. I want every person with a disability who has the capacity and wants to work to be able to get a job. I want to make sure that employers see employing people with disability um, as a mainstream everyday activity that they build it into their business model. And I want everybody who's living with a disability, if they want to be, I want them to be a taxpayer because I know it's great for them, it's a great outcome for their communities, it's a great outcome for their families, and it's a great outcome for our society as a whole. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how is the government supporting people with a disability through the National Disability Insurance Scheme? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, the National Disability Insurance Scheme is having a profound effect on people, on the people's lives who live with disability. For the first time, they have an absolutely unprecedented opportunity to actually have choice uh, and control for themselves and for their families. Um, and we will continue to make sure that the NDIS is fully funded through a strong economy. Um, the NDIS, though, um, we have seen 311,000 Australians who live with disability now supported by the NDIS. And one of the most phenomenal figures that's contained in that 331,000 people is the 37 per cent, or the nearly 115,000 people who live with disability who are getting supports for the first time in their lives. We understand that this is a very, very important scheme. Um, for people with disability, and we remain absolutely focused on rolling this scheme out in the best interests of people who have disability. Before I come to you, Senator Brown, can I draw to the attention of senators the presence in the gallery of a parliamentary delegation from Fiji, led by the Hon. Alexander O'Connor, Chair of the Fijian Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defence. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and, in particular, to the Senate this afternoon. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Rustin. Today is International Day of People with Disability, a day in which we celebrate the achievements of people living with a disability and reaffirm our solidarity to work with them to overcome their barriers which prevent them engaging fully in society. The Morrison government continues to go slow on implementation of the NDIS, using so-called underspends to prop up their budget bottom line, claiming $4.6 billion in the last financial year. When will the Morrison government finally unlock this funding that Australians living with a disability so desperately need? Yeah. Yeah. The Minister representing the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and, and I thank Senator Brown for, for her question. And I also thank Senator Brown for the opportunity to sponsor your motion this afternoon, where we recognise people um, who have, uh, live with disability and to celebrate their day today, uh, where we recognise the amazing contribution that they make to our society. So, Senator Brown, I thank you very much for that opportunity. But what I would say is that the NDIS is a demand-driven model. 
which means that, uh, that the model is that the, the amount of money that is spent um, on providing the supports and, and the services that people who live with disability require through the NDIS is based on demand. Now, I acknowledge that, this, uh, that the scheme has not rolled out as quickly as was originally forecast, but we're very pleased to see that, as we stand here today, Senator Brown, that 311,000 Australians uh, are receiving the supports and services through plans with the NDIS uh, to enable them to be able to fulfil their life's goals and, uh, and their dreams. But to come in here and suggest that, that the, somehow the government has, has, has created um, a, you know, a, a budgetary saving on the back of the NDIS is blatantly not true. It is a demand-driven and it is a demand-driven system. I'm sure, and over the, the coming years, as we're accelerating the rollout of the NDIS, we will start to see uh, the, the full expenditure of the budget for the NDIS. But uh, let me be very, very clear. Uh, it is a demand-driven system. The government is committed to provide the funding in order to support every Australian who is eligible for an NDIS plan, who seeks to have one. We will stand absolutely committed and side by side all Australians with disability, particularly on this day, as you rightly point out, the International Day for People with Disability, to make sure that this once-in-a-lifetime groundbreaking opportunity that the NDIS is, is delivering for all Australians who live with a disability. Senator Brown, a supplementary question. And thank you, Mr President. The NDIA originally estimated its staffing levels would be 10,595 <coughs> staff by 2018-2019. But the Morrison government has imposed a staffing cap of 4,000 employees. As a result, participants are missing out on the support they need, and $430 million was spent on consultants and contractors in 2018 alone. When will the Morrison government unshackle the NDIS by lifting, lifting this artificial staffing cap? Order. Senator Brown. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, and I thank Senator Brown for a follow-up question. Um, the government absolutely is committed to making sure that we roll out the NDIS and we provide the supports and services that Australians who live with disability um, can rightly expect from this amazing once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Um, as Senator Brown would be aware, um, that uh, we have already made the announcement that we are intending to uh, uh, add an additional 800 uh, public servants, that's APS positions, capable of exercising delegations under the NDIS over the course of the 2019-20 year. Um, we also acknowledge that one of the great challenges moving forward, and we are working on this as we bring providers on, is to understand that the workforce that's going to be required to support the rollout of the NDIS is something that we are going to have to be working side by side with the NDIS and disability service providers to make sure that those services are able to be delivered in a timely and appropriate manner to people who live with disability. Senator Brown, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. On Friday, Minister Robert announced that he would build an ontology of capabilities across government. What did the minister mean? Given the government's approach to digital transformation has delivered the illegal ro robo debt scheme, what hope do Australians living with a disability have that the minister will deliver a nirvana for accessing the services they so desperately need? Senator Rustin. Uh, look, thank you, thank you very much. Um, and, uh, and whilst I'm not going to um, sort of uh, de deliver, dissect exactly what the minister said, what I can say is uh, that this government is absolutely committed, Order. absolutely committed to making sure that the rollout of the NDIS is fit for purpose and is delivering the best possible outcomes for the people that we seek to assist. Uh, with the, the NDIS, and that is people who live with disability, the very people who today, internationally, we celebrate the amazing contribution that they make to Australia and, uh, and particularly to our society um, here. So uh, the, the, the opportunity and the magnitude of the rollout of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity will require a very integrated um, rollout across the whole of Australia, because this is not just for people who live in cities. We are ensuring that we reach people with disability who live in regional, remote and rural communities, which is something that we are absolutely committed to. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. My question is to Senator Birmingham, representing the Minister for the Environment. The World Heritage Committee gave Australia homework four years ago to show why the Great Barrier Reef shouldn't be listed as in danger. 
On Sunday, your government sent in its homework in a glossy report, pretending everything's fine um, and downplaying the dramatic decline in conditions as merely impacting on the reef. How can you claim to be actively managing the key pressures when half of the coral cover of the reef has bleached to death, when you've set up an inquiry questioning reef science, and when your own reef management authority has downgraded the long-term outlook for the reef from poor to very poor for the first time? Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Waters uh, for her question, although I don't accept all of the assertions made uh, in, uh, in her question there. Uh, the government takes the health of the Great Barrier Reef incredibly seriously, Mr. President. That's why uh, we have uh, supported record levels of investment in support as part of our reef protection efforts, which are designed to build uh, resilience for the reef, uh, to address the many challenges that it faces, and to do that indeed jointly with the Queensland government, noting the speaker sitting alongside you. Uh, Mr. President, we, uh, as part of our reef protection efforts, have developed the Reef 2050 Long-Term Sustainability Plan, developed jointly with the Queensland government. We work alongside traditional owners, industry, scientists, farmers and the wider community to implement uh, that plan. Uh, the Australian and Queensland governments are investing some $2.7 billion uh, from the period 2014-15 through to 2023-24 uh, to implement our plans to support the reef. Uh, these plans are comprehensive in terms of working to improve water quality and coastal habitats, tackling outbreaks of crown of thorns starfish addressing plastics and protecting threatened and migratory species. Uh, Australia's management of the reef uh, is recognised as a leading example in terms of protection for large-scale marine protected areas uh, and was identified such in previous UNESCO uh, reports. We are investing in the long-term support for reef activities through the Reef Trust Partnership and with the Great Barrier Reef uh, Foundation uh, and continuing to invest further in terms of additional support uh, for uh, controlling crown of thorns starfish and working with farmers to improve reef water quality. And overall, our efforts are about making sure we take the action necessary to sustain the reef as one of Australia's great environmental assets, one of our prime uh, tourism assets, and we continue to support the communities in the reef and to make sure they are able to promote its world-class attributes to the world. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. The latest IPCC scientific report confirms that if global temperatures rise by one and a half degrees, 90 per cent of all coral reefs will be lost. And all of them, 100 per cent of coral reefs, will be lost if we hit two degrees. And yet your government's policies have us on track for at least three degrees of warming. When will your government end its war on science and implement a climate policy to limit global warming to one and a half degrees to protect what's left Order. of the reef? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, I completely reject the, uh, the points that, uh, that uh, Senator Waters has sought to make there. Uh, as I outlined, I think it was in a quest response to a question from Senator Waters only last week. Uh, our government has detailed, in terms of our climate solutions package, right down to the last tonne, precisely how we propose. Uh, I, I know Senator Wong uh, isn't, uh, isn't seemingly interested in the fact that we're going to meet the 2020 order. targets. Senator, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Well, he took the interjection. Point of order. That was not what I said. I said he order, didn't believe Senator it. Wong, I said that, that he didn't not, believe in, it. In, in, interjections, order. Interjections are disorderly and responses to them are not encouraged. I've got Senator Waters on a point of order. President, nobody believes it. Order. I'm not going to. Uh, even in the Christmas spirit, I'm not going to tolerate it getting like this on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, Senator Birmingham. Thank, well, thanks, Mr. President. I'm not sure there was a lot of Christmas start. spirit in those comments either. So uh, I'm not sure there would be an accurate reflection, uh, even from the chair, Mr. President, if I may say. Uh, but in terms of in terms of our commitment, the government is uh, and has outlined detailed plans to meet our 2030 targets in relation to climate action. That's what the climate solutions package takes through, ton by ton. Senator Waters ought to know that, ought to acknowledge that, uh, ought to stop misleading in that sense that Australia has met and exceeded our targets to date, and our plans are about ensuring we continue to do so into the future. Would, uh, Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Uh, thanks, President. If you were truly managing the pressures on the reef to protect it and the 64,000 jobs that it supports, you would revoke all federal approvals for the Adani Carmichael coal mine and not approve any new coal in Australia. 
Your UN Reef homework doesn't disclose the millions in donations from big oil, uh, big coal and big gas to your party over the last four years. When will you ban donations from the fossil fuel industry, an industry which benefits quite nicely from your government's lack of climate policy? Order. Um, again, I remind senators about the rules about supplementary questions. There doesn't need to be a link to the first question. I'll call on the minister to respond as far as it is with the responsibility uh, Portfolio as he represents. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, that supplementary question from Senator Waters highlights the complete misleading rubbish that we get from the Australian yeah, Greens, yeah, yeah. who, when it comes, when it comes uh, to addressing climate policy, decide instead to bring it into a whole range of other matters and ignore the fact that this is about dealing with a global problem through global cooperation and action. Australia plays our role. We have done so consistently over recent years in terms of signing on to global climate change agreements, acting in accordance with them, signing on to future agreements such as the Paris Agreement, and we are acting in accordance with that. It doesn't come down to a single piece uh, of regulatory approval for one mining project. It doesn't come down to what the nation's electoral financing laws might look like. It comes down to working in concert with other nations to make sure that we deliver upon our commitments and to ensure that they deliver upon theirs, and that's what we're committed to doing. Order. Senator, can I remind senators of a previous ruling about supplementary questions? And I'll quote President McClelland, taken to start reading precedent on this. Supplementary questions are appropriate only for the purposes of elucidating information arising from the original question and answer. They are not appropriate for the purpose of introducing additional or new material or proposing a new question, even though such a question might be related to the subject matter of the original question. That is a ruling from President McClelland in 1986. Um, and it is in Odgers, and it is the guiding principle about supplementary questions. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence and concerns the operation of the Chinese-owned mining company CU River Mining in the Woomera prohibited area. Can the Minister confirm that her department has reviewed uh, CU River Mining's compliance with access conditions set by the resource production permit issued uh, to the company by Defence? Did that review confirm any instances of non-compliance or other security issues relating to the activities of CU River Mining or its Chinese partner? Zhejiang Mining. Uh, how does any security uh, uh, problems, or have any, uh, how have any security problems been resolved? Has the department changed or modified the access conditions applying to CU River, ac CU River's activities on the Woomera Range? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and also I thank uh, Senator Patrick for that question. And I also thank him for the courtesy of prior notice. And it's actually quite refreshing to get an issue of substance, a question of substance from the other side of the chamber. So, in relation to, in relation to your question, uh, the Woomera prohibited area is a key national security asset and Australia's most important weapons testing range. So, this is why the Morrison government takes the preservation of the unique capability very seriously. Uh, dealings between permit holders within the Woomera prohibited area and defence are subject to strict security, privacy and also commercial considerations, so it is not appropriate for me at this time to discuss the details of individual permit holders. Uh, however, I am aware of the allegations of possible access and security breaches at the Cairn Hill mine, and I can confirm to the Senate that Defence takes these matters extremely seriously. While I, I cannot discuss these matters publicly to afford all parties due process, I can say, however, that defence does balance national security requirements with non-defence activities under a coexistence framework at Woomera, where access is granted, but only where it doesn't put defence's uh, interest at risk. So, to achieve this, defence works very closely with security agencies uh, to ensure its security posture and policy in the Woomera prohibited area is agile and also reflects current threats. Uh, Defence also conducts six monthly audits of all uh, permissions to access the Woomera prohibited area, and in light of the evolving security environment, I have directed Defence to examine, review and audit processes of all permits. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr President, and thank you, Minister. What discussions has uh, CU River Mining held uh, this year with Defence concerning the proposed expansion of its mining operations? When did the company make formal application to expand its operations in the prohibited area? 
and uh, what has been uh, Defence's decision in relation to that? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thanks, Senator Patrick, for, for that question. Uh, as I stated in my previous answer, dealings between individual permit holders and defence are subject to security, privacy and also commercial considerations, and therefore it is not appropriate for me to discuss the detail or outcomes of individual applications. However, what I will say is this, that where necessary, permits will not be issued where the security of defence activities may be compromised, and where permits are issued, they may be subject to additional conditions to manage and mitigate risk, or, as I said, they may not be issued at all. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Minister. Given growing concerns about Chinese espionage in Australia, what assurances can the minister give that the presence of a Chinese-controlled uh, mining company on the Woomera Range won't undermine confidence in security there, a vital facility being upgraded to support increased defence trials by not only Australia but also by our, by our allies? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thanks, Senator Patrick. And I can assure you and all in this chamber that Defence has a very strong legislative and policy framework which provides compliance, assurance and mitigation measures to uphold security in the WPA. The number one priority of our government is to keep Australians safe. As I outlined to the chamber yesterday, the government is further strengthening Australia's response to the threat of foreign interference with a new task force to disrupt and deter anyone attempting to undermine our nation's interests. The Morrison government will continue to take strong action to deter acts of foreign interference and, as the threat evolves, defence, uh, defend against them where they occur in accordance with Australia's laws. Senator Stirl. President, uh, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Last night, Minister Senator Davey told the Senator, and I quote, I facilitated a meeting today between members of the convoy and the Minister for Water Resources, David Littleproud, and the Minister for the Environment, Susan Lee. When did the Minister first become aware of the meeting between irrigators, irrigation farmers, community members, business people with Ministers Littleproud and Lee? The Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Stirl. Uh, I became aware of that meeting when Senator Davey shared that with me earlier on this week, that that's been something she'd been working on as part of uh, living, working, raising a family, running a business uh, in the Southern Basin as uh, a rice grower. So she's been a strong advocate of irrigation communities, and I would recommend everyone in the Senate actually tune in to the adjournment speech she gave last night, which actually spoke to the impact of the drought on these communities, on the work that our government has done to assist farmers and their communities who are struggling with a lack of water, uh, and her desire to actually see mutually beneficial outcomes between people that have concerns about the implementation of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, uh, the state's government's role, the water sharing arrangements and indeed our federal government policy. So hats off, Senator Davey, for a fantastic meeting. Uh, and I know that each and every one of our backbenchers here, uh, senators are continually raising uh, issues with ministers, making sure that they broker meetings with uh, their constituents and stakeholders in their respective states and areas of interest with the ministers. That's called being in government and actually assisting your constituents to get things done. Senator Stirl, a supplementary question. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mr. President. Minister, were you invited to participate in the meeting? And if not, why not? Senator McKenzie. Well, there's a lot of meetings that happen, Senator Stirl. Um, I'm not invited to a lot of them, as is the Defence Minister not invited to a lot of them. The, the Minister for Skills is not uh, invited to a lot of them, etc. So I'm the Minister for Agriculture. I'm involved in uh, stakeholder meetings to do with the agriculture portfolio, the Minister for Water Resources, uh, Drought and Emergency Services, who is also responsible for the implementation of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, is the absolutely appropriate minister to actually be conducting that meeting, as is uh, Minister Lay, who has responsibilities for the Commonwealth Water Holder. Senator Stirl, a final supplementary question. It is. Thank you, Mr President. Given Prime Minister Morrison was the first to announce an extension to government payments for drought-affected farmers without Nationals' leadership, 
and that Senator Macdonald has resorted to lobbying major supermarket CEOs herself, is the meeting facilitated by Senator Davey just the latest example of you, Minister, being bypassed? Senator Mackenzie. Uh, look, what a long bow. Um, Nash, as I've said earlier to Senator McCarthy's question, National Party MPs and senators are not backwards in coming forwards when it comes to writing to lobbying uh, supermarkets about. And Bozzy's a classic example. I'll take the interjection. Bozzy Order. and Wacker and Barry, classic examples of former senators who have sat in this place and have lobbied hard, CEOs of supermarkets, as we all have. We have sought to have better competition laws. It is the National Party that fought for changes to the Trade Practices Act in Section 46 to actually back smaller producers against the might and market power of our retailers. And we don't shy from that at all. We're proud of that. It's actually what we're here to do on behalf of our communities and our industries. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr Order President. Senator My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Liberal National Government sound budget and economic management is guaranteeing essential services that protect Australians online, including what the government is doing to promote an open, free and secure cyberspace. Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Bretz uh, for his question and his interest in these issues. Mr President, an open, free and secure cyberspace is essential to driving economic growth, to protecting national security and to promoting international stability, but it isn't something that we can take for granted. Ours is a whole-of-government approach. The Minister for Home Affairs is leading the development of Australia's next cyber security strategy, and internationally we are focusing on maximising opportunity and minimising risk. The boundaries of acceptable behaviour in cyberspace are being challenged, whether by states or cyber criminals. The damage, the disruption, the disinformation caused by malicious cyber activity is significant and growing. In New York in September, I co-sponsored the joint statement on advancing responsible state behaviour in cyberspace with the United States and the Netherlands. That statement has so far been affirmed by 28 countries. Led by our ambassador for cyber affairs, Toby Feakin, Australia is helping to build the technical, the policy, the legislative and enforcement capacities of our regional partners as well. We also have to make every effort to deter those who would seek to misuse cyberspace uh, as a vehicle for repression and control and instability. Our rapidly developing critical technologies, such as artificial intelligence and quantum computing, are already having profound strategic and, po and foreign policy impacts. And other technologies, such as deep fakes, have the potential to disrupt relationships and to undermine public trust and confidence. The government is ensuring that we are taking a coordinated, strategic approach to ensure that Australia continues to benefit from technological advancements. The work that we are doing is widely regarded and highly respected Mr. President, around the world. It is uh, something on which, uh, of which we can be very proud and on which the government uh, is very focused. Senator Betts, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for that very detailed answer. and I ask further, can the minister advise how Australia is working with international partners to promote stability in cyberspace. Senator Payne. Mr President, we're a leader in shaping the future of cyberspace to ensure that it, is a, it remains as a positive driver of economic growth and sustainable development. We're working, of course, with our Five Eyes partners, as well as through the United Nations, through the ASEAN Regional Forum, for example, to help build stability in cyberspace. We promote the application of international law in cyberspace and reinforce norms of state behaviour that complement confidence-building measures. Uh, in uh, both of my roles uh, Mr. President, as Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister for Women, we are also focused on ensuring that women are involved in the cybersecurity conversation, including by supporting the attendance of a number of female diplomats from South Pacific and ASEAN countries at UN discussions on cyber in New York. Senator Betts, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise on steps the government is taking to deter and respond to malicious cyber activity? Senator Payne. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Betts for what is a very important uh, supplementary question. Australia and a growing number of other states are cooperating to deter and to respond to malicious cyber activity. Having established a firm foundation of existing international law and norms of responsible state behaviour, the international community also has to ensure that there are consequences for those who engage in unacceptable behaviour in cyberspace. And Australia is taking a strong stand against malicious cyber actors. In fact, in cooperation with international partners to ensure the maximum strength of our message, we have previously publicly attributed malicious activity to, to Russia, to uh, North Korea, to China and to Iran. We will continue to make our decisions on public attribution of cyber incidents in our national interests and particularly in relation to those with the potential to disrupt global economic growth, national security and, economic and international stability. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Senator Reynolds. Julie Ann Finney has collected nearly 270,000 signatures on a petition to the minister to call a Royal Commission into veteran suicide. Ms Finney's son, David, was a veteran who suffered from PTSD and sadly took his life in February. Last month, the minister rejected calls for a Royal Commission into Veterans Affairs, who reportedly told Ms Finney, and I quote, that he would rather hold hundreds of cor coronal inquests rather than calling a Royal Commission. Does the minister believe the DVA's current approach to veteran suicide is working? The minister representing the Minister for Veterans and Defence Personnel, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and uh, I thank Senator Lambie for that question, and I also commend her for her deep and abiding interest in and support for our veterans. It's greatly appreciated. Um, can I start by saying, Senator Lambie, that it is a national tragedy that over 3,000 Australians take their own lives every year. There is no single solution to this sad and highly complex issue. When it comes to suicide, the only acceptable number of veterans' uh, suicide is zero. And the only acceptable number for the Australian people, more broadly, is also zero. Mm -hmm. The government recognises the sacrifices made by ADF members and their families. The loss of a current or former member is deeply felt by the entire defence community and also, I know, by all in this chamber. Mm -hmm. The government considers that all options should be on the table to address this complex issue of suicide across the Australian community, which of course includes our veterans. As the Prime Minister has said, and he just reaffirmed, I understand, in the other place, uh, that it, is, it has not been ruled out and it is under active consideration, along with the government's response to the Productivity Commission report and a range of other uh, is issues. Uh, the Productivity Commission report itself was tabled in Parliament on 4 July this year and outlines very comprehensive recommendations to update a century-old system of support for veterans and their families to ensure that it is fit for purpose for, for the next 100 years. And we're very grateful for the bipartisan approach that's adopted uh, by those on the other side of the chamber. We are talking extensively to veterans, their families and all other stakeholders to co-design the next DVA and defence mental health and wellbeing strategy and also a national action plan for veterans. But transforming DVA is only part of the solution. The broader issue of veteran suicide cannot just be fixed by government alone. Like suicide more generally, Order. it Senator is an issue Reynolds, for us all. Time for the answers expired. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Our veterans are, clear, are clearly struggling to cope with PTSD and other afflictions that they've developed as a result of their service. But the DBA seems to be hell-bent on making their lives more miserable than ever. Is the minister aware that the department is currently fighting the claims of a 94-year-old war, World War II veteran and holder of a military cross, John Hutchinson? Why is the DVA going after vulnerable war veterans at 94 years of age? Senator Reynolds. Uh, Mr President, I'll have to take on notice that particular case that Senator Lambie has cited. But can I just say that I do not for a second believe that DVA has uh, anything but the best interest of all veterans uh, at, at their heart. And I just want to quote, if I could, uh, what the Prime Minister has just some of what the Prime Minister has said in the other place. Um, he wanted to thank the department and the ADF for the changes that have been implemented. And again, I note that they have had bipartisan support through the various tranches of legislation that's already gone through this chamber. But the Prime Minister <coughs> said, as he said to Julianne Finney, I wish that those arrangements had been in place when her son had been in the Defence Force. 
I wish they had been in place for all of those Australians who have served and have passed away as a result of their own hand. And all of those, uh, and those lessons are now being put into place. But he also said that he welcomes further input and feedback from veterans on the other side of the chamber, in fact, on all sides of the chamber. Order. And today Senator he met Reynolds, with the member for time Herbert to discuss the this matter. has expired. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Stories like this, this one show that the DBA in defence is not looking after our veterans who are vulnerable. The Minister of Veterans won't commit to holding a Royal Commission, so I have to ask those, and from one woman who served to another, and you were a brigadier, and this involves these both defence and DBA have diggers under them that are actually hurting a lot and are not getting their claims for not getting their claims through Department of Veterans Affairs. I want to know why the top brass, or used to be the top brass in our military, is not standing by their Order, former diggers Senator Lambie, and asking for a royal ask commission. The question has expired. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, I thank Senator Lambie. And what I would do is extend an offer to Senator Lambie for specific cases and specific details. Please do come to myself or the Minister for Veterans Affairs, and we can work through those individual cases. But just to confirm, uh, the Prime Minister has again reiterated today that he has given an undertaking to reflect further on the issue of a Royal Commission, and he will reflect on it deeply over the break, including doing more consultations. Uh, but, and I'll, can I also just say, Senator Lambie, uh, Defence does recognise that transitioning from military service to civilian service can be a significant life-changing event for the 5,500 people every year who do transition out of Defence. Uh, while the vast majority do transition very successfully, we do know and understand that there is a percentage who do not, uh, which is why we have put in a comprehensive range of measures both within Defence and in to DBA to make sure that we uh, identify potential people at Order. risk Senator uh, Reynolds, much earlier and assist them. For the answer has expired. Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Mackenzie. I refer to an article published by The Guardian entitled Row Between Order. Two National MPs. Order on my sorry, stop, pause the clock. I would like to be able to hear the question. I've got to the title of the article, Senator Billick. Please continue. Uh, row between two national MPs prompts bullying complaint from Michelle Landry. When did the minister first become aware of the bully, bullying allegations and has she, as deputy leader of the nationals, taken any action as a result? Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you for your question, Senator Billick. Billick. Um, we don't take, uh, we don't, no, we take bullying very, very seriously within uh, the National Party, uh, and any matters of that uh, ilk are dealt with by the administrative wing uh, and are taken very, very seriously. We have a uh, fully developed bullying policy, and our federal president, um, Larry Anthony, uh, and our federal director, Ben High Marsh, uh, take any such um, accusations very seriously. Senator Billick, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Garden reports that the argument between Ms Landry and Mr O'Brien broke out after Mr O'Brien accused Minister Mackenzie of allowing One Nation to take credit for the Dairy Code of Conduct and said it had been his intention to call a spill against her. Can the minister confirm that her poor performance as Minister for Agriculture is causing tensions in her own party room? Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you very much, Senator Billick. And it's been great to head down to your home state recently to talk about how gangbusters agriculture is going in the great state of Tasmania. And not just agriculture, but thanks to the election of the Liberal Hodgman government, fisheries and forestry as well. Our side of politics backs agriculture, its growth and development. The National Party knows how important a vibrant agricultural industry is to regional employment and how it underpins our national economy. And that is exactly what we've been doing post-election, focusing on how we grow and develop agricultural employment, more market access, ensuring that our farmers are more competitive internationally. Is this a, sorry, I was talking, take, seeking advice from the clerk. Have you concluded your answer, Senator McKenzie? Or, 
Oh, right. Senator Billick rising on a point of order. I'm rising on a point of order, Mr. President. Relevance. The um, minister has not gone anywhere near answering the question, which was: um, Is she? Is she, um, can, can she? Can she confirm that her poor performance as Minister okay, for again, Agriculture I, uh, order, is causing Senator tensions Billick, in her own so I'm party not going room. to allow the word relevance to be inserted before rereading the second part of a loaded question. It would be very difficult for me to rule the minister out of order, because as I said yesterday. Ministers can, as long as they are directly referring to or addressing, including challenging, material or assertions contained in a question or a preamble, as long as they are directly doing that, I think that is being directly relevant. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I reject uh, the second part of that very long-winded question, but I'm very proud to talk about our government's uh, performance in agriculture since the election. Senator Billick, a final supplementary question. Uh, Mr President, thank you. Um, and it is my final supplementary, so maybe we can get an answer. Is the minister confident that she retains the support of her party room? One question. Senator McKenzie. Uh, well, Senator Billick, yes I do, and we are very excited about the program we have Order. as a national party in government to continue, as we have for a hundred years in this place, to deliver for our regional communities and ensure that not just our dairy farmers through the delivering of a mandatory code six months earlier, but making sure our research and development corporations are fit for purpose in the 21st century, ensuring that we're going after new market access so that our beef industry, our fishing industry and our dairy industry actually have competitive prices around the world for our safe, sustainably harvested food production, to make sure the changes we're making in workforce uh, application right across the country, making sure farmers can have the workforce they need in the place and area that they need them to get the crop off, to make sure that our water policy is right, because in this country you can't grow anything if you don't have your water policy settings right. I am absolutely confident in our agenda order, to Senator deliver McKenzie, for agriculture. Senator McKenzie, time for the answer has expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Mr President. My question order. is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Canavan. Can the minister advise the Senate how the Liberal National Government's sound budget and economic management is guaranteeing funding for the infrastructure that Australian families and business rely on, including projects like the inland rail in my home state of Queensland? The minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Uh, for that very important question. A lot going on in infrastructure in Queensland. Mr President, it's all part, all part of our more than $100 billion spend, record spend on infrastructure. This government is taking a record spend from this government on infrastructure. That's supporting more than 80,000 jobs uh, in Australia uh, at the moment, uh, with projects under construction. And you mentioned there, Senator Rennick, the inland rail. And I know you're a big supporter of particularly opening up agricultural opportunities in this country, and the inland rail does just that. The inland rail is a nation-building project that will hook up Melbourne to Brisbane uh, for the first time with a proper inland freight rail, rail network, which will cut time, save money and support jobs. Mr President, it will create a steel Mississippi through the spine of our country, Mr President. Uh, the corridor of order. Commerce. Senator Rennick on a point of order. Point of order, Mr President. Despite being on the same side of the chamber, I'm having problems hearing the minister because of the interjections from the other side. Well, I, I, order. I would urge senators to heed the request of other senators who would like to hear an answer. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, as I was saying, this will create a corridor of commerce in inland towns through our country uh, because, as the CSIRO has estimated, this project will cut $76 a ton, a ton, Mr. President, off freight costs between Melbourne and Brisbane. It will save more than 24 hours. Sorry, it will, it will allow transport to occur under 24 hours. For the first time, Mr. President, we'll have rail journeys under a full day between Melbourne and Brisbane. Mr. President. It is a shame Mr. President, that the Speaker of Queensland is no longer with us, because I know he takes a keen interest in rail projects in his home state. And last week, we signed a bilateral agreement with the Queensland Government to finally get this project going in Queensland. Um, a big part of the spend, about $6 billion of the $9 billion project will be 
is spent in Queensland, in your home state, Senator Rennick, my home state, fantastic project supporting over 7,000 jobs in Queensland. Around 15,000 jobs will be created through the life of this project, but it's not just about the jobs that are created during construction. It is about opening up our nation for commerce. It is about connecting up rural towns to better freight options. It is about supporting agricultural and the expansion of agricultural industries because the closer they are to port, the closer they are to their customers in Asia, which will mean more production here and jobs in Australia. Make a supplementary question. Can the minister outline how the government's sound economic management is enabling investment in this transformative infrastructure? Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, the only reason this government has the capacity to make these nation-building investments, these game-changing investments for our country, is because we have managed our nation's uh, budget. It's because we have managed other people's money better than others have come, but than they've done before us. Because, Mr. President, we are producing the first surplus in this nation in a decade. That allows us to have the capacity, Mr. President, to invest in things that will make this country stronger. So yes, this is a large project at over nine billion dollars, the inland rail. But allow, but by managing the budget properly, we can have the funding to open up these opportunities for Australian farmers, for Australian regional communities. But it doesn't stop there, Mr. President. We are also investing. For there's more. It's $44 million uh, in a facilitation program, in an infrastructure improvement program alongside the inland rail to help small projects like to hook up with grain silos and sidings that, off this major trunk line to open up opportunities for small towns uh, through rural New South Wales, rural Queensland and rural Victoria. A fantastic project that we are building on over many Order, years to Senator build a better, strong, better country. Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. How many jobs will the government's infrastructure agenda create in my home state of Queensland? Senator Canavan. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mr. President. It will create thousands of jobs, Mr. President. Thousands upon thousands of jobs will be created. I've already mentioned the 7,000 jobs, Mr. President, from the inland rail. But there's lots of other projects as well. A few weeks ago, we announced that we'd bring 20 projects forward in Queensland, bring infrastructure funding forward to create more jobs sooner in, in Queensland. Uh, around 28 projects now, 28 infra eight infrastructure projects will start in Queensland next year. So as we go into Christmas, only a few weeks away from next year, we're only a few weeks away for thousands of jobs being created in Queensland due to our infrastructure funding. For example, Mr. President, upgrades on the M1 Pacific Motorway from Eight Mile Plains to Daisy Hill and from Varsity Lakes to Tugan, they will create those projects. Those two projects will create over 1,500 jobs. On the Bruce Highway, Mr. President, a range of projects, including the Mackay Northern Access upgrade, the Cairns Southern Access project, the Saltwater Creek upgrade, the Maroochydore Road Interchange and the Deception Bay Road Interchange will all start next year, creating over 1,300 jobs. And I'm going to run out of time, but there are other projects creating over 1,000 jobs as well. Jobs and jobs and jobs. Order, Senator, Canavan. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. The minister yesterday refused to confirm whether the Minister for Emissions Reduction would submit to an interview by the Special Strike Force, Strike Force Jared, established by the New South Wales Police Crime Command's Financial Crime Squad to investigate his possible criminal behaviour. I asked the minister, will Minister Taylor submit to an interview with Strike Force Garrod? Yes or no? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. That is not what I said to the chamber yesterday. I said very clearly that the minister has indicated and the government has indicated uh, that we will cooperate, the minister will cooperate and his office will cooperate with the investigation. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. The minister yesterday undertook to update the Senate if the Minister for Emissions Reduction or anyone in his office had spoken to the New South Wales Police. Has Minister Taylor or anyone in his office been interviewed by police? Can the minister guarantee that all current and former staff of Minister Taylor will be made available for interview and all office material will be securely archived in light of the investigation? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, I have reflected on the question that was asked by the opposition yesterday. The opposition have asked for this inquiry and this investigation. The opposition have sought it, allegedly seeking an independent inquiry and investigation into this matter. Mr. President, out of respect for an independent inquiry and investigation into this matter, I don't intend to come into this chamber and seek to provide a running commentary in relation to this investigation. The government has been clear 
there will be full cooperation with this inquiry and investigation if there are questions in relation to the conduct of that inquiry and investigation those questions ought be directed to the New South Wales Police. Senator Watt, final supplementary question. I note the minister's evasions to these questions. Can the minister guarantee, can the minister guarantee that all current and former staff of Minister Taylor will be made available for interview and all office material will be securely archived in light of the investigation? Just guarantee it. Order. Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, it's a, it's a good thing the Speaker of the Queensland Parliament's already left and couldn't see the lack of uh, agility from, uh, from Senator Watt in relation to that question that he still read, despite the, fact, despite the fact that question was clearly dealt with in the previous answer, Mr President. Now, those opposite want to run a order. kangaroo court. Senator Watt, those on a opposite order. Senator Watt or Senator Wong on a point of order. Mr. Mr President, this is about whether staff who are actually the Prime Minister's staff, because all staff are the Prime Minister's staff will be made available for the New South Wales Police. The Minister's evaded it once. I think the Chamber is entitled to an answer. On the point of order, Senator Cormann. On, that, on the point of order, Mr President, uh, the, the Minister was not only directly relevant, he actually directly answered the question. Uh, in absolutely directly answered the question. Uh, as much as the Labor Party might think it's a matter for uh, Labor not only to write letters and initiate investigations, but also to conduct these investigations. But the minister is not in a capacity, he's not in a position uh, to uh, provide a running commentary uh, in relation to the conduct of an independent law enforcement investigation. The point of order uh, that Senator Wong raised should be, should be dismissed. Um, it, is not, it is not for the chair. Order. It is not for the chair to rule on the content of answers as long as they are directly relevant. It is not for me to instruct the minister how to answer a question. There is an opportunity after question time for debating answers. The minister is being directly relevant, even if it is not the preferred mode of answer of those asking it. Senator Birmingham to continue. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, the government could not have been clearer about the full cooperation that will be provided to this investigation. But those opposite who asked for this investigation now seem to be doing th everything possible to try to undermine or corrupt the investigation rather than letting it run as an independent order. investigation. Senator Wong, you don't like it, order. Do you, Senator? Senator Wong on a point of order. That is, that is uh, an inappropriate inference. We are, not trying to, we are not trying to influence the investigation. We are asking whether order. you will make your staff available, because we remember order. what there Minister Cash did. Order. There is an opportunity for debating. Senator Cormann, I'll take a submission from you on, a, on the point of order. Well, again, I mean, Senator Wong is not raising a valid point of order. She's raising a debating point. Uh, very clearly, the Labor Party thinks that not only should they be initiating a politically motivated uh, investigation, they should also be conducting it and, and forming judgment order. And, and providing judgment. Order, and you're Senator also, you're also, and Senator this is, Wong. This is, this is a kangaroo court Cormann and a witch hunt if ever I've seen Wong. one. This is the Senator, Senator Cormann and Wong, please resume your seat. Really? Really at the centre table, Senator Cormann and Wong. Order. Order. It is not for the chair to be ruling on the content of answers nor instructing ministers how to answer them, and points of order are not supposed to be debating points. Senator Birmingham to continue. Now, Mr. Mr. President, the government has been clear we will cooperate. We will cooperate, Senator Wong. We will cooperate throughout this investigation. You don't like the fact that we say we'll cooperate and that it's now an independent investigation. Because you know what your track record is from independent investigations initiated by Mr Dreyfus? Order, Senator Birmingham. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice Order. Part. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to ask the Minister for Aged Care and Seniors when the Senate can expect an answer to a question he took on notice in question time on Tuesday, 26 November 2019. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Keneally. Thank you. 
In question time on Tuesday, 26 November 2019, the Minister for Aged Care and Seniors took a question asked of him took a question on notice asked of him by Senator Ciccone. The question asked how many Australians have died whilst waiting for their home care packages in the last financial year. On Monday, 2 December 2019, I wrote to the minister and noted that he had not come back to the chamber with an answer to the question. I invited him to provide an answer to this question at the conclusion of question time yesterday, which he did not. I asked the minister, minister if he has an answer to the question, how many Australians have died whilst waiting for their home care package in the last financial year, and indicate the opposition will grant him leave to do so. Minister. Deputy, Pre oh, sorry, Deputy President, my apologies. Um, Mr. Uh, Deputy President, as I indicated when Senator Ciccone asked me the question, it, that it is a legitimate question and it's a serious question. Uh, what I would like to do is to provide accurate information to the chamber. I commit to doing that as soon as I possibly can. I have received some advice from my department, which I've asked from for some additional information on. My office has gone back to the department to clarify that. I will supply an answer to the chamber as soon as I possibly can. Senator Keneally. I move to take note of the minister's response. Uh, you I need seek leave. leave to do that. Is leave granted? So leave is granted for up to 10 minutes, uh, Senator Keneally. I understand arrangements have yes, been made. Yes, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, well, we want an answer. We in the Labor Party want an answer to this question. Senator Ciccone asked Minister Colbuck a, ve Colbuck a very straightforward question last Tuesday. How many Australians have died while waiting for their home care packages in the last financial year? Whether by his shame or his incompetence, the Minister has failed to provide this chamber with an answer. I wrote to the Minister yesterday asking him to provide a response to the chamber after question time. We heard nothing from the minister yesterday, and his silence, his lack of an answer here today, has necessitated this action. I should note that since last Tuesday, a number of government ministers have come in this place and provided answers to questions they took on notice or updated responses that they have given to the chamber. This is standard practice for ministers. It's one of their most basic responsibilities. And yet, Minister Colbeck has even failed to do this here today. At Senate Estimates on 23 October, Senator Watt and Senator O'Neill asked officials about the number of people who had died in 2018-19 financial year while waiting for their home care packages. So just to be clear, in October, Labor senators asked how many people had died in the 2018-19 financial year, a year that had gone, come and gone while waiting for their home care packages. We know the figure for the previous financial year. It was 16,000. 16,000 Australians died before they got the home care package that they were assessed to need. Senators Watt and O'Neill were told that the department didn't have the updated figures yet for this last financial year. And when pressed for a date that they would be available, the department responded, and I quote, it is certainly close. I think it would be within a month. Well, a month has come and gone. They have missed that deadline. We're now in the final sitting days of Parliament for this year, and we are still without an answer from the minister and his department. This is just like the contempt that the Prime Minister is showing for ministerial standards in relation to the Minister for Emissions Reduction. Here we have the Minister for Ageing showing contempt for this parliament and, more disgracefully, showing contempt for older Australians who need a home care package. But what, here we are in the parliament and the minister is refusing to answer a basic question in his portfolio. Now, that may not grab the attention of the public in the same way that a minister who is being in the other place, who is in being investigated by the New South Wales Police Force uh, through a criminal task force. That's not. That is not what this is. This is a minister who, though, is showing the same contempt for ministerial standards. That is, he is not answering a basic question asked of him in this parliament about a basic figure 
within his portfolio. It is a basic figure he should know, but it is not basic in terms of the import that it has for older Australians who are waiting for their home care packages, where 16,000 died waiting the previous financial year. All we want to know is how many died in the last financial year waiting for their home care packages. I mean, how far will, will ministerial standards slip under this third-term Liberal national government? As the minister says, he's acknowledged that this is a legitimate question. He said it last week. This is a legitimate question. It's one of the reasons why the government takes the issue of aged care and the growth of aged care, uh, home care packages so seriously. Well, if he takes it so seriously, how can he not know the answer? How can he be talking about increasing home care packages when he doesn't even know how many people are missing out on home care packages, how many people are dying waiting for their home care package? It, appear, it would appear that the basic responsibilities of a minister answering questions from his parliament, parliamentary colleagues, being held accountable to the Australian people, are a bridge too far for Senator Colbuck. He has shown contempt for the parliament, but as I say, more importantly and more significantly, through his administration of this portfolio, the aging portfolio that looks after older, vulnerable Australians who need our help, seniors who've given their lives to building their families and their communities in their time of need, when they need a home care package, what do they get from this government? Neglect, lack of information, not sufficient supply of home care packages, that is the utter contempt that Minister Colbeck is showing to older Australians and to this parliament. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, and just to follow on from Senator Keneally, uh, like many on this side of the chamber and indeed in our community, I take, take the care of our older Australians very seriously. And that's why, um, Last, late last month, I asked the Minister for Aged Care about the number of Australians who have sadly passed away whilst waiting for an aged care home package. Many in our community, just like I and many others in this chamber, were horrified by the interim report that was handed down by the Royal Commission on Aged Care, and in particular by the number of older Australians that were left without the care and the support that they need so that they can live comfortably in their own homes. The fact of the matter is that home care packages are so drastically underfunded by this Conservative government. Thousands and thousands of older Australians sadly are dying before they get the chance to receive the care that they deserve. Now, members of the community are right to demand transparency from their government on this issue as much as anyone else. They have a right to know how many older Australians have died waiting for a package this year and the year before and the year before that. But when I asked the minister a very simple question, The simple answer that we got from the minister at the time is that he just did not have the latest figures. And that is why we are seeking to have those figures tabled here into the chamber and we gave the minister an opportunity again this afternoon to place on the record what that simple figure is. Now he has a whole department behind him, thousands of people who could easily provide him with that figure. And I guess um, from the comments that were provided by the minister earlier, I suspect that that figure is slowly making its way through. But for whatever reason, the minister refuses to provide this chamber with an answer, a simple answer, to a very simple question. Now, my community in Victoria deserves to know what the truth is. Every older Australian that is waiting for a home care package and their family members and carers deserve the truth. The minister must come to this Senate by the end of the week, ideally today or tomorrow. But we'll see if he comes to this chamber by the end of the week and provide an answer to my question. The fact that he didn't know the answer back when I asked him in late November is outrageous enough. 
It demonstrated to all of us in this place that either he's uninformed about the matters relating to his own portfolio or that he lacks interest. To delay his answer even further, to hide the truth from the Senate and through us, the Australian people, is shameful. One is left to wonder why is it that other ministers, as Senator Keneally has also articulated earlier, other ministers have been able to table answers to questions that were asked in this chamber a lot sooner than what Senator Colbeck has been able to do so far to my question. What is the minister hiding? And I think people in the gallery and those who are listening have a right to know what is it and why is it that the minister has taken so long to provide an answer to a very simple question. Deputy President, it is fundamental it, it, it is a fundamental responsibility of this place to hold any government of the day to account. The Australian community expect us as senators to ask these very questions, and these questions need to be asked. For any minister of the Crown to simply ignore this place, to disrespect the Senate and through it to the Australian community is very much unacceptable. And I and my colleagues call on the minister to provide an answer to my question as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. So the question is that Senator Keneally's motion to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to um, motions to take note of answers. Senator Chisholm. I oh, beg your pardon, Senator Waters. Yeah, thank you. I'm just rising to take note of the uh, response to my question to Senator, uh, to Senator Birmingham. You, sorry, weren't you just trying to move to motions? Yes, we're just moving to motions now, and Senator Chisholm had the call. We just, we've just started to deal with them because uh, Senator Keneally had leave to deal with a separate issue. So we haven't, we're just starting taking note now, so and I've called Senator Chisholm. Thank you. Senator Chisholm. Uh, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator McKenzie to the questions asked by Senators McCarthy, Stirl and Billick. Uh, I recall, and there's not much I want to remember after the federal election campaign, but there's one thing I do remember, and that is that uh, I recall Senator McKenzie demanded the agricultural portfolio. She actually went in there and she said, I want the agricultural portfolio. Well, you would have to ask yourself why. Why did she want that portfolio? And if you look at three significant issues that are confronting rural and regional Australia, and these have an impact on all Australians, on every issue the minister has either gone missing in action or mismanaged or failed to deliver. So look, let's look at those three issues. The dairy code of conduct leaving dairy farmers hanging now for so long as they are doing it tough. The Murray-Darling Basin Plan, yesterday a target of protesting farmers uh, in this place and around parliament. And the drought response, always responding and never putting forward a cohesive plan for those communities impacted. So let's go to each of those issues in a bit more detail. On dairy, the minister has overseen a complete market failure. They're not my words. They're the words of Senator Macdonald, her own National Party colleague. And yesterday, what we saw in this place was the government refusing to allow debate on a bill that would secure milk prices and save the industry. The government would not even let us debate that issue. Uh, as we know, they've been keen to shut down debates on a number of issues over the last week. In regards to the Murray-Darling Murray Basin Plan, we know the minister was sidelined in the meeting between irrigators, impacted community and business people, a meeting once again organised by her own National Party colleague, Senator Davey. So Minister Littleproud was invited, uh, Minister Lay was invited, but the agriculture minister was not invited to that meeting yesterday that had those people, those uh, impacted irrigators, community and business people. And then we know the response on drought has been flat-footed. Uh, we know that the National Party and the Minister has been ignored by the Prime Minister consistently on this issue and is always on the back foot, so never putting forward a cohesive plan to deal with drought response and look after these communities so that they know they have a long-term plan. 
are always playing catch up. And then when the Prime Minister does make a piecemeal announcement, the National Party and this minister were sidelined. So there are so many issues to confront for regional and rural Australia. On every occasion, this minister is not delivering. And so damaging has this minister's performance been, it is causing divisions within the National Party itself. So we know the position for the member for Lyon, Dr Gillespie. He warned that if the minister's draft code dudded farmers, he refused to rule out a leadership tilt as a result. So the performance of this minister, her own colleagues are targeting uh, this minister in terms of her performance when it comes to dairy. Uh, we also know that the minister's performance is causing colleagues to turn on each other. So we know from the question time, the question that was put by Senator Billick to the minister uh, in regards to a row between uh, the member for Capricornia and the member for Wide Bay over the minister's performance. So even her own colleagues are turning on each other over the minister's performance, refusing to rule out a challenge to her position because they know that the performance of this minister is having an impact in communities in rural and regional Australia. So Minister Mackenzie's performance post-election is dairy code dysfunction, chaos in regards to their handling of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and flat-footed on drought response for those communities impacted. And at the centre of National Party infighting over the minister's performance, so much so that even the, uh, Queensland's National Party colleagues are turning on each other uh, because of this performance. So this minister is responsible for a policy failure, a policy failure on dairy, a policy failure on the Murray-Darling Basin and a policy failure when it comes to drought response in this country for so many communities that have been impacted so devastating by the drought. Standing by as rural and regional Australians are suffering. So the minister has responsible for these issues that are so important to these communities, yet the minister is standing by and becoming a target of criticism for her own colleagues. The National Party is turning on each other. So instead of fighting for those people who are suffering and those communities who are suffering and those people who voted for them at the election, they're actually getting stuck into each other. Uh, this is how bad this performance has been by the minister, that that is what it is leading to. So dairy farmers deserve so much better. Those dairy farmers in Queensland deserve so much better. But rural and regional Australia deserve so much better from this minister and this government. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator Seselja. Well, thank you, Deputy President. And again, if you wanted an example uh, of why the Labor Party are in opposition, we saw it uh, in today's question time. We saw it in that performance from Senator Chisholm. Uh, talking about their performance there in Queensland, uh, which we'll come back to. But we see it in the pathetic attacks on Senator Mackenzie uh, in this place. And what we have seen, and Senator Billick asked in one of her questions about bullying, uh, what I have seen over a period of time from the Labor Party is every time we have a high-performing senior female cabinet colleague, the Labor Party seeks to bully them. And we're seeing it again with Senator Mackenzie. We see it with Senator Watt all the time. We heard it from Senator Chisholm. We used to get it absolutely ad nauseum from Senator Cameron who every time there was a female colleague, particularly people like Minister Cash, you would have the disgraceful bullying attacks that were coming from Senator Cameron. And this pylon, this pylon that is not based on any substance, let's be clear, it's not based on any substance. I listened, I listened very closely to these questions. Issues around the dairy industry are very important. Issues around getting these things right. But the questions didn't go to that. They went to tidbits of gossip uh, that have been published by unnamed sources in such and such a paper, in such and such a publication, asking about absolutely nothing. And this is what the Labor Party has resorted to. They're not prepared to actually sit and debate the issues. Senator Mackenzie is going through the process of getting this right. And you know what? A reform like this is not easy. A reform like this is not easy. You are dealing with disparate interests in different parts of the country. Uh, and if it was that easy, it would have happened a long time ago. But she is getting on with the job of taking on that difficult reform. Instead of engaging in that discussion, what we have is the politics of smear and bullying from the Labor Party, which we have seen so often. You know, I'm reminded again of Senator Cameron uh, when he would come into this place and he would say to Senator Cormann, uh, well, why do you need to hold Minister Cash's hand? I remember Senator Cameron coming in this place and, say, and calling uh, 
calling female colleagues silly schoolgirls uh, when he didn't like what they were saying. Uh, you know, this has been the modus operandi of the Labor Party uh, right up to the last election. Uh, they, were at, they were at it for the whole six years they have been in opposition. They have been at it for the six months uh, since they were consigned to opposition again. And if you want to get to the why, it is because they don't want to address the substance. Now, there are a lot of important issues to be talking about in this place. And the Labor Party has failed to address them. Uh, you know, that's why they go the politics of fear and smear. They're walking away, I think, from their attack on, on uh, Angus Taylor, on Minister Taylor. Uh, you know, they came right at the end after having a, a fruitless go at Minister Mackenzie. They come right at the end. And I wonder why they're walking away from that attack. And, and, I, and I'd, put it to the, I'd put it to the Senate, I'd put it to senators as to why. It might be because, uh, far from it being uh, Minister Taylor's credibility that's now on the line, it's now, it's now Shadow Attorney General Dreyfus's credibility that is on the line. Well, you may laugh, Senator, uh, but when you've got a record of that many vexatious referrals to the police, that much wasting of the resources of police on your, on your baseless political attacks, who is going to hold you accountable? So, so if, if the, the police were to come back and say nothing to see here, as they have every other time, that Minister Dreyfus has actually referred someone. Isn't it time that, Minister, that Shadow Attorney General Dreyfus resign? I mean, how many, how many more times can he get it wrong? So they don't want to talk about that anymore because that attack isn't working. They're very comfortable in the sort of bullying, gossipy, aggressive attacks on Minister Mackenzie, which are getting nowhere near the substance. But I'll tell you this, uh, Deputy President, they don't want to talk about the facts. Because when it comes to policy, uh, we know where they stand. Uh, when it comes to the economy, they know they don't have a leg to stand on. Because what was their economic policy, which is still their economic policy? $387 billion of extra taxes. The politics of envy. The politics of class warfare. Uh, you know, they talked about the NDIS in their questions. Well, let's look at their record. They weren't able to deliver the NDIS. They didn't have the money. They left a funding gap. Just like they couldn't list drugs anymore on the PBS because they can't manage the budget, they can't manage the economy. When your record is as bad as the modern ALP, I would suggest to them it's time to change tack. The bullying and the smearing and the politics of fear uh, may, may suit your personalities, uh, but it does nothing to benefit debate in this country and nothing to bring you back into Thank government. Thank you, Senator Seselja. Your time has expired. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Well, uh, the minister has been asked uh, questions today, uh, important questions that go to her capacity and her performance in her portfolio. Uh, she's been asked about delays to her long-awaited dairy code. Uh, she's been asked why her backbench is taking matters uh, into their own hands and going straight to industry uh, themselves in search for solutions. She's been asked how her dairy code has, and I quote, dudded farmers, and of course that's a, a quote from her own side, uh, not from the Australian Labor Party, uh, and how her dairy code has caused leadership rumblings in her own party. Uh, she's been asked today why meetings about solutions for farmers are being held by the Nationals without the Minister for Agriculture even being invited. Uh, she's been asked today about growing tensions in her own party room about her leadership, uh, questions that result from her performance in this portfolio, a critical portfolio for Australian farmers and, of course, for many communities. Uh, and at a time when hundreds of dairy farmers are being forced to leave the land, these questions raise really serious issues about the minister's capacity to come up with solutions. Uh, they raise serious issues about her capacity to manage her portfolio, uh, and they raise uh, serious issues around uh, this minister's leadership. Uh, and of course, what we've heard from the minister today uh, in uh, answer to our questions uh, are statements along the lines of that she supports dairy farmers, uh, that she acknowledges that dairy farmers are doing it tough. Uh, she says that she is confident in her ability to deliver. Uh, but the question is, is her party 
confident in her ability to deliver? And are Australian dairy farmers confident in this minister's ability to deliver? Uh, is the community confident in her ability to deliver? Uh, and of course, today, Senator Mackenzie's answers are really all just uh, words. This minister is all delay and no action. Uh, and now we're seeing a revolt in the nationals in her own party uh, against her performance in this portfolio. Uh, and when you listen to the comments made by Senator Sazelja today as well, even he has failed to back her in, uh, because all he could do today uh, in his efforts was to attack the record of the Australian Labor Party. Uh, and actually, what we're asking about today uh, is Senator Mackenzie's record. We're asking about her record and her accountability to the Australian people, her accountability uh, to Australian dairy farmers. So, Deputy President, uh, it seems that yet again uh, the junior partner of the coalition uh, are in quite some strife. Uh, now, we know that this government is used to publicly airing their dirty laundry when it comes to their leaders, uh, and they're not shy about kicking them out either. But the fact that we have yet another member of the Nationals' leadership team with a question mark over her leadership uh, is absolutely unbelievable. Uh, and let's face it, after her uh, answers to our questions, we are no closer to finding out whether she actually does have the true confidence of her colleagues and her party room. Uh, it certainly doesn't look like she does um, from the commentary of her own party over the last few weeks, because over the past few weeks we've seen time and time again examples of national senators and MPs publicly calling the minister out, calling her out on her record, going behind her back, bypassing her and even refusing to rule out a challenge to her leadership position. Uh, that is where we're at with the Nationals today. Uh, and if this is the level of confidence in the minister from her own party, how can the parliament and the public be confident in her ability to do her job? Uh, because we are really yet to see any meaningful action on the crisis facing dairy farmers today from this minister. Uh, this is an industry that is in crisis, and what they don't need is a minister in crisis. What they don't need is a Nationals Party in crisis, and they don't need a government in Thank crisis. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Your time has expired. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, I th know that the Labor Party has sunk to, uh, to new no lows following the election. I know they're struggling to, uh, to get back in the game. But really, outsourcing your agricultural policy to One Nation, I mean, that is just quite extraordinary. We had Senator Chisholm stand up and describe how they were supporting the uh, proposal put forward uh, yesterday uh, in this place, uh, the dairy bill put forward by the One Nation Party, which I find just so extraordinary because it just shows how little knowledge the Labor Party actually have of the bush and have of agriculture. Uh, that policy would be absolutely disastrous. Floor prices, as I have spoken about in this place before, are disasters for agriculture. They are repeated disasters across wool, sheep meat in Western Australia, uh, 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 the wheat market, uh, very other, various other forms of price controls and controlled marketing have been an absolute disaster for the Australian agricultural sector repeatedly over generations. Uh, the, the wool reserve price scheme, which collapsed in uh, the early 90s, led to 10 to 15 years of, of, uh, of struggle for that industry, only in the last six or seven years finding its feet uh, uh, after a period of stagnation. Um, floor prices have disastrous outcomes. Let's have a look at the bill that uh, One Nation has put forward and which Labor is enthusiastically supporting. Think about that again, those opposite and those listening here today, that you're enthusiastically supporting a rural policy put forward by One Nation. Uh, so we've got purchasing, uh, making it a fence for processors to purchase milk at a price below a determined base price. Now this is going to be a deterrent for processors to buy milk from farmers in regions with a higher farm gate price. Think about it for a moment. Why are you going to buy milk 
from farmers in places like Queensland, where Senator McGrath comes from, my home state of Western Australia, northern New South Wales, if you have a floor price that is too high, they will go to the cheapest, price of, uh, cheapest source of production, which in Australia is the Victorian farmers, uh, who largely supply an international market. The proposed bill, therefore, incentivises the purchase of milk away from those higher cost producers in Queensland, northern New South Wales and Western Australia, um, which makes it even more difficult for those places to um, compete. This bill will destroy the fresh milk market somewhere like Queensland, in the northern New South, north of New South Wales and Western Australia, my home state. Farmers will be left with milk in vats because their milk will not be nationally competitive. Now, Minister Mackenzie is doing an absolutely outstanding job. The Dairy Code of Conduct is a very important reform, but it is something that this government is absolutely determined and Minister Mackenzie is absolutely determined to get right. She wants the whole industry on board, uh, understanding what the code is going to do, how it will operate and making sure that the Dairy Code of Conduct is fit for purpose. And that means uh, significant amounts of consultation, which is what Minister Mackenzie has been doing. Now, those opposite also want to attack uh, the government over the response to drought. And it is a comprehensive response and one that should be acknowledged and talked about as a positive for this nation, the fact we do have the resources to be able to respond to difficult circumstances, <laughs> to be able to help those farmers in need. And uh, make it a highest priority of government, as this government has done, uh, particularly since coming back into uh, uh, government. Uh, what have we done? We've committed to uh, our latest announcements have committed over $709 million to support farmies, $50 million to extend the Drought Communities Program to even more councils, $10 million to keep kids in schools, $5 million for childcare drought loans up to $2 million with no repayments or interest for the first two years, a new small business drought loan, $200 million extra in the Building Better Regions Fund and $138.9 million extra in roads to recovery again for drought affected areas. Uh, we've committed an additional $355 million to step up our drought response. Uh, our latest announcement triples this to more than $1 billion since the election as well as more than $1 billion in new interest-free loans to help see three people through the hard times. This government is acting. This government cares about Thank the you, bush. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Your time has expired. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I also rise to take notes of questions by Senators McCarthy, Stell and Billick. But before I do, I can't help but call out the appalling hypocrisy of senators on the other side, particularly Senator Seselja in accusing members on this side of sexism. Are their memories so short? Are their memories so short? Because I remember the Gillard Prime Ministership. I remember the Ditch the Witch posters out the front of Parliament House, which senators and members stood in front of. I remember, I remember the way our first female Prime Minister was treated. I remember the way other Labor women members of Parliament have been treated. And instead of defending the minister in question, instead of defending her performance and her record on these issues, instead of defending policy failures, the audacity to come out to Labor senators on the issue of sexism. The audacity. I remember, we remember, the public remembers how you treated our first female prime minister. Yeah, good on you. Real good. Now, to the issue, and the issue is Minister Mackenzie. The issue is a question of performance of a minister in the portfolio of agriculture, a portfolio that she wanted, and a portfolio which seems to be run by backbenchers. That's what these questions were about today. That's what the questions were about. Questions on backbenchers being better advocates for the dairy industry to the CEOs of Coles and Woolworths than the minister questions about backbenchers organising policy meetings, which the minister wasn't invited to, 
Actually, we had the extraordinary uh, revelation that there's lots of meetings the minister isn't invited to. I wonder how many more, how many more in her portfolio is she ignored from and is she separated from? Backbenchers are running it. And when asked questions about the leadership within the Nationals, asked questions about internal instability, asked questions about debates over policy, we got deflect, deflect, deflect. And then when we come in here to debate this issue further, we got the extraordinary display from Senator Seselja. The extraordinary display. Not a defence of the minister, not a defence of policy failures, not a defence of whatever's going on in the National Party, not an admission that backbenchers are running the show, not the executive. We got an attack on this side because they can only talk about this side. When you don't have anything to talk about yourself, when you don't have your own policies, when you don't have your own views, when you can't control your backbench, when your leadership's in trouble, when your position is in trouble, you go after us. After us. Well, as you keep reminding us, day in, day out, we're not the government. You are. You're the government. These are your responsibilities to own up to. This is your portfolio to take control over, take control off the backbench and into the executive. But you, you don't. You just focus on us. You focus on One Nation. The Nationals are meant to be standing up for rural and regional South Australians, South Australians. That's what they tell us every day. That's their constituency, rural and regional South Australians. Well, where are they on dairy? Where are they? Well, I know where the backbench is, actually. They're doing a pretty reasonable job. Where's the minister? What's she doing? How's the Nationals going in South Australia? That's where it's heading. If you can't get control over this, if you can't get control over the policy, if you can't show leadership, if all you can do is focus on us, all you can do is stoop so low, so low, as to launch those extraordinary attacks on Labor senators, given the track record of your side on these issues. Well, what hopelessness is that? How hopeless for the people who depend on the nationals. How hopeless for our dairy farmers. How hopeless for people in rural and regional Australia. How hopeless. The backbenchers are running the show. The backbenchers are advocating more than the minister. And we're asking, where is she? What's she doing about it? And all you will do is focus on us. Focus on the policy. Order. The question is the motion moved by Senator Chisholm be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I rise to take note of the uh, response given to my question by Senator Birmingham. I asked about the state of the reef because, of course, over the weekend the government handed in Australia's homework to the World Heritage Committee. Uh, people might remember, I certainly remember, that four years ago the reef narrowly avoided being listed as in danger. Um, such listing would, of course, sent massive shockwaves through the tourism industry. And um, this government really had a strong warning. Then, do you think they did anything about it in the intervening four years? Well, sadly, no. What we saw over the weekend was a glossy report um, that contained phrases like, uh, "We're actively managing the key pressures," and rather than acknowledging what has been a drastic decline in the health of the reef, it uses phrases like. There's been impacts on the overall universal value of the reef. Well, those impacts are dire indeed. After those two bleaching episodes in 2016 and 2017, 50 per cent of the coral cover of the reef died. Like it bleached and then it died. So it ain't coming back from that. Uh, not only that, we then saw the Great Barrier Reef uh, uh, Gabrumpa, the Marine Park Authority, do its standard assessment of the reef's health and downgrade its assessment of the long-term health of the reef from poor, which is already an embarrassment, to very poor. So this is the government's own agency sending a damning assessment of the long-term health of the Great Barrier Reef. And what does this government do? Well, it hands in its homework, basically saying, go back to sleep, everything's fine. And this is after our delegation at that World Heritage Committee pre-meeting 
had lobbied for climate change to not be a relevant consideration when thinking about whether sites should be on the endanger list. So I'm afraid this government has got an absolutely atrocious track record when it comes to addressing the health of the reef. And of course, I asked the minister this, and his response was, what? oh, we made a record investment. They privatised the management of the reef by giving almost half a billion dollars to a small charity that may well do good work, but that certainly hadn't sought half a billion dollars of public funds to somehow manage the terrible state that the reef is in. We've had subsequent Senate inquiries along those lines, and my colleague Senator Wish Wilson has done some excellent work at uncovering the absolute dodginess and lack of transparency um, in that particular financial decision of government. Um, but that doesn't deter this government. So privatisation of the reef um, and absolute tone deafness to the climate science. I then asked the minister, well, what about the IPCC report, that, that international climate uh, regular report that says coral reefs are in real strife? We all know that the climate's already changed by one degree, but these scientists are saying if we hit one and a half degrees, you lose 90 per cent of coral reefs. And what's even more scary is if you hit two degrees of warming, you lose all coral reefs, 100 per cent, gone, nada. That's the 64,000 people that rely on the Great Barrier Reef remaining in the state that it's in, remaining uh, moderately healthy for their own livelihoods, gone. All of those jobs gone and one of the seven natural wonders of the world gone. And rather than really sit with the enormity of that scientific advice, this government instead does the la 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 la, we're meeting and beating our targets. The science is saying your targets are too weak. Nobody accepts you're going to meet them, but even if you did, they are still too weak. They have us on track for at least three degrees of warming. And at two degrees, we lose all coral reefs. When are you going to wake up? Now, I asked why the reef homework didn't mention the millions of dollars in donations from big coal, big oil and big gas to this government and, frankly, to, to the Labor Party as well, because we think that's why we have non-existent climate policy and we think that's why the reef is in such a predicament, because this government is getting paid by the coal and fossil fuel industry to have terrible policies that trash the reef. Now, the president, who's in the chair at the minute, said that there wasn't enough link uh, between that issue and my question about the reef. Well, if you can't understand the link between coal and climate change and the fact that it's cooking the reef, then that is indeed a, a grave problem. So I maintain that that question was perfectly relevant. In fact, it's the whole point. This government cannot see that, and it's an absolute travesty because we have the future of the largest living organism on the planet at stake. We've got the scientists ringing the warning bells and the alarm bells, and they have been for years now. There's 64,000 people that deserve their job protected. You don't hear this mob talking about their jobs or their livelihoods. They're too busy taking the money from big coal, big oil and big gas. So we will keep advocating and working as hard as we can to protect what's left of the reef, but this government just keeps taking the money uh, and the reef's future is at stake. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it.